Today the is the Jewish festival of Hanukkah or dedication. It's ongoing this past week and it's now coming to an end. And the earliest written records of Hanukkah uh, being celebrated are actually found in the New Testament in John chapter 10 verses 22 to 23, where we read, Then came the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. It's winter and Jesus was walking in the temple area in Solomon's portico. So here we find Jesus in Jerusalem and he's here to celebrate Hanukkah. He's here to celebrate the Jewish winter festival. Hanukkah is one of those festivals that's not mentioned at all in the Old Testament because it happened, the events surrounding Hanukkah happened between the Old and the New Testament. And yet here we find Jesus celebrating it. The story of Hanukkah is found in some Jewish books written between the Old and the New Testaments uh, called First and Second Maccabees. They're part of what Protestants refer to as the Apocrypha, uh, books that are good to read, should be read, but which are not considered scripture on the level of scripture. They are, however, considered scripture by Roman Catholics, by Eastern Orthodox Christians, by the Syrian uh, Church, by the Armenian Church and by the Ethiopian Church. So if you want to read the stories yourself, you can open your Version Bible app and, you know, in Bible version, select the Good News Catholic edition. And then you could just read them there in the Good News version if you wanted to. The story begins around 323 BC, when Alexander the Great of Macedon has just died. He had conquered Turkey, Egypt, the Middle East, including modern day Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, right up to the very border of India. A Greek is now the official language across most of the known world. Alexander's generals are now fighting amongst themselves who possesses the empire and it splits and fragments. One of the successor states is Ptolemaic Egypt. Another was the Seleucid Empire in modern day Syria, Iraq and Iran. Uh, the area around modern day Afghanistan was a, a Greek kingdom that adopted Buddhism and became the official religion and it fused Buddhist and, and Greek influences together. The Jews, however, found themselves caught between Ptolemaic Egypt and the Seleucid Empire. Both empires constantly fighting over the land of Israel because of its strategic importance. And during this period, many Jews learned Greek because Greek is now the language that everyone knows. And Greek philosophical ideas spread into the religion as well of Judaism. And whilst there are many Jews within the land of Israel, there's major populations of Jews in Egypt around Alexandria and in the Seleucid Empire around Babylon. And during this era, the Old Testament is translated into Greek in Alexandria in Egypt. And the Jews start to write many books in Greek. Uh, both the Egyptians and the Seleucids could, um, could be very repressive of Jewish identity. Ptolemy IV of Egypt at one point tried to force the Jews to worship the Greek god Dionysius, uh, branding all those who did join in and enslaving those who didn't, branding all those who did join in with a, an ivy leaf. You know, as a symbol of the god Dionysius, a concept that perhaps would inspire latest Jewish writers like John to talk about the mark of the beast. In 175 BC, a man named Antiochus IV Epiphanes came to the throne of the Seleucid Empire. His name literally means a manifestation of God. So he had a high view of himself or perhaps low self-esteem. Um, but he, he named himself that. And the Jewish high priest, uh, Anias uh, III, was murdered and his brother was elected. And the son of Anias fled to Egypt and the Pharaoh Ptolemy VI had a Jewish teacher of philosophy. And the Pharaoh welcomed all of the exiled Levites and the priests and he allowed them to build a rival Jewish temple in Egypt that existed all the way through the time of Jesus until 73 
AD when the Romans destroyed it in case it became a focal point for another Jewish rebellion after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. So we've got the the Jewish high priesthood in um, in uh, Jerusalem uh, from from Jason, but we've also got Ananias and his descendants uh, as priests of the temple in Egypt as well. And back in Israel, the Seleucid Empire, uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, mistook uh, a coup in the leadership of the Jewish high priesthood as a full scale rebellion. And Jewish practices are banned. Jerusalem is placed under direct control of the Seleucid government. Uh, pigs are offered to Zeus on the Jerusalem altar at the temple. Circumcision, other signs of Jewishness are banned. Jews are told to sacrifice to the Greek gods. An, an abomination of desolation is set up in the temple, probably some sort of statue to Zeus, and Torah skulls are burnt. And in 167 BC, a saluted Greek government official arrives in the rural town of Modin to ask the Jews there to sacrifice to the Greek gods. And a local Levitical priest, a man named Matthias, refuses and he launches him and his children his sons launch what is known as the Maccabean Revolt. Matthias and his sons led a guerrilla warfare campaign to liberate the Jews from the Greeks and to restore the Jewish religion. They win a, a decisive victory at the Battle of Emmaus, leaving way for the Maccabean forces to enter Jerusalem and to triumph and ritually cleanse the temple and re-establish traditional Jewish worship there said that when they re-entered the temple to cleanse and to rededicate it there's not enough oil in the menorah you know the tree-shaped candelabra that represents the tree of life in the, the garden of eden as it were you know in the the tent the garden sanctuary of the tabernacle also um, stands for branches of human knowledge the candle in the middle pointing all of humanity towards the light of god uh, there's many symbolic meanings here and the maccabees found just one jar of pure oil, enough, enough for the whole candelabra to be lit for a single day. And yet it lasts miraculously for eight days until they've managed to press some more olives to produce some more pure oil. And so this is the Jewish Winter Festival of Lights to mark this miraculous dedication of the temple, how one jar of oil managed to last for the eight days miraculously so returning to john chapter 10 verses 22 to 24 we read then came the feast of dedication in jerusalem it was winter and jesus was walking in the temple area in solomon's portico and the jewish leaders surround him and they asked how long will you keep us in suspense if you are the christ tell us plainly Imagine the suspense is in the air here. Jesus is in Jerusalem, it's Hanukkah. Uh, they feel oppressed by the Romans and they're looking for another Maccabee who's going to take up the sword and liberate them from the hands of Rome, who's going to break the shackles. And it's a loaded question that they're asking Jesus here. How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. The Jewish leaders perhaps have their hands on their swords. Will he proclaim himself to be the Messiah? Will he challenge the Romans? What better time to do it than Hanukkah? Jesus, however, replies in John chapter 10 verses 25 through to 30. I told you and you do not believe the deeds I do in my father's name testify about me. But you refuse to believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they know me. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them from my hands. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one can snatch them from my father's hands. The father and I are one. The response causes them to want to stone him. And in verse 33, we read the Jewish leaders replied, we're, we're not going to stone you for good deeds, but for your blasphemy, because you, a man, 
they're claiming to be God. So in this passage, Jesus wants his audience to understand he is the word of God. So he, you know, he refers back to Psalm 82 and talks about those to whom the word of God came, those who he came to, you know, standing in the council. Um, and he then he wants to know that he's come from the father into the world. He's about the father's business, not their anti-Roman political agenda. There's worse powers than Rome powers in the unseen world that need overthrowing far more than Rome needs kicking out. How true is this for us as well? How easy we can focus on political agendas of the now and the here and the now, fighting political battles to the left or, or to the right. We can get so caught up in things that are fading away that we forget to build things that are going to last forever, things with a foundation built upon faith, hope and love. Throughout John's Gospel, he, we may have these references to Jesus as the light. We read in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke again, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me never walks in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, we must perform the deeds of the one who sent me as long as it is daytime. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus is the light. And while we have life, we're called to be guided by his light in every area of our lives. Just as the menorah stands for light and knowledge of God, so too we must set our eyes upon the light that is Christ, who is the light of God. In John Chapter 1, verse 8, uh, verse 9 to 10, we read, The true light that gives life to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created by him, but the world did not recognise him. Friends, the enlightenment of the world is still darkness. We boast about our own knowledge, of our own enlightenment, but it's still darkness. Only the light of Christ can light up our lives. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus tells us about a parable of ten virgins in Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. We read this. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of the virgins were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish ones took their lamps, they did not take extra olive oil with them. But the wise ones took flasks of olive oil with their lamps. And when the bridegroom was delayed a long time, they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. But at midnight there was a shout, look, the bridegroom is here. Come out to meet him. And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our light lamps are going out. No, they replied, there won't be enough for you and us. Go instead to those who sell oil, buy some yourselves. But while they had gone to buy it, the bridegroom arrived and those who were ready went inside with him to the wedding banquet. And when the door was shut, later the other virgins came and said, Lord, let us in. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I do not know you. Therefore, stay alert because you do not know the day or the hour. The parable is a warning to all of us. Just because Christ, the bridegroom, is delayed in returning does not mean that he is not the coming bride, coming for his bride. He is coming, but he's delayed in his coming. No, rather, we must be on our guard. We must be vigilant. We must not become drowsy or fall asleep in our Christian walk. For Jesus tells us to stay alert because we do not know the day or the hour of his return. It speaks of our own death as well, also of his second coming. Friends, we do not know when the last hour of our lives will be. Are you ready to meet him? Have you repented of your sins? Are you turning back on sin and have a desire to get rid of the wrong within you? Are you chasing after the good, the true and the beautiful things of God? There are two ways in this life, one of life and one of death. And there's a great difference between the two ways. The way of life is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And love your neighbour as yourself. The end of Luke's gospel culminates in 
Christ revealing himself on the road to Emmaus in the breaking of the bread and in the, the scriptures. And followed by, in Luke's narrative, the disciples of Jesus going back to the temple, staying in the temple courts and praising God continuously. And then Luke picks up the narrative in the next part in the beginning of Acts. And these events parallel the events of the Maccabean revolt itself, with the Battle of Emmaus being followed by the rededication of the temple back to God. And Luke describes the rededication of the Messianic people, the people of the Messiah, as the temple. And this is shown in Acts with the coming of the Spirit to fill not a building, but the people, to be a living temple. So we have the cross of Christ that is a far greater victory than the Battle of Emmaus. Death itself is trampled down by the death of the Messiah. The powers, the principalities, the gods who rule over the nations are disarmed. They're delegitimized of their rule. The power of sin is broken. The Greek empires are long gone. Where are the Greek gods now? The Roman Empire is long gone. Where are the Roman gods now? But the kingdom of Christ remains. Hanukkah then is the temple, uh, is the dedication of the temple back to God, a foreshadowing of the day of Pentecost and the dedication of the messianic people as the new temple, the dwelling place of God. He has his light upon us. And his light leads us to the truth. We read in Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp to walk by, a light to illuminate my path. And the word is Christ himself. It's the scriptures, but it is also Christ. Christ is the word of God. And he's the lamp who leads us, the light to illuminate our path. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, uh, verse, sorry, 19 and 20, Paul writes, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. Paul uses here the language of possession. We've been purchased by Jesus Christ from the dark powers, and now we belong to him. Our ancestors lived in bondage to the false gods, to the gods over the nations, but the Passover lamb has been sacrificed and we've been led out of our own Egypt, our own spiritual Egypt. Our bodies are temples of God's spirit. And this means that all of us, what we do with our bodies matter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 to 17, Paul says, don't you realise that our bodies are actually part of Christ?" Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it with a prostitute? Never. Don't you realise that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, sorry, he becomes one body with her. For the scriptures say the two are united into one. But the person who's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Friends, because we've been mystically united with Christ, um, we live in him and he lives in us. And we should consider that what we do with our bodies is what Christ is doing. Think deeply here about what Paul is saying. In Acts 9 verses 4 to 6, when Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, we read, He fell on the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Paul says. And the voice replies, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up, go into the city. And you'll be told what you must do. Notice here the words of Jesus. Who is Paul persecuting? Christians. He's hunting them down. He's killing them. And yet what does Jesus say? He says, why are you persecuting my people? No, he doesn't say that. Why are you persecuting my body, the church? No, he doesn't say that either. He says, why are you persecuting me? An attack on a Christian is an attack on Christ himself because we are one body with him. He's the head of the body. So how we use our bodies, is, it's not a private matter. It isn't just between you and whoever. Your body is Christ's body. 
That's Paul's whole point. We're the temple of God. Let each of us rededicate ourselves for noble and good purposes in the world, to use our bodies as lights pointing to the great light that is Christ himself. Teresa of Avila is quoted as saying this, Christ has no body on earth now but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks with compassion on the world, and yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. If this is true, then how should we live our lives? How should this impact our thoughts, our words, our actions? If it's your hands that God uses to bless the world, then how should you use your hands? If it's your body that is part of Christ's body, then everything matters. How you treat other humans matter. They're the image of God. How you talk matters. How you act matters. If it's true that yours are the feet with which he walks to do good, yours are the hands with which he blesses the world, that understanding should change how you live your life. Other people are not objects to be used, but people to be loved. And this is what it means to be the temple of God, a resting place for his spirit. We become a place of healing for those around us. However, in order to bring peace, we must first bring peace to ourselves. Uh, what is our relationship with God like at the moment? What is your relationship with the Father? When was the last time you just spent time resting in his presence without an agenda? When did you last set aside time to meditate on a passage of scripture or just on the character of God itself? When did you last speak with him? In James chapter 4 verse 8 we read, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. If you're not feeling close to God at the moment, then ask yourselves about your relationship with him. Do you need to draw near to him in the secret place that he might draw near to you? Do you need to prioritise meeting with him? Do you need to set your alarm in the morning so that you can have 20 minutes just meditating upon God? In conclusion, friends, let us take this Hanukkah opportunity to rededicate ourselves to be living temples, to become sacred space where God dwells by his spirit, that we might be the hands and the feet of the Messiah this week in the world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that we might be your people this week, wherever we go, bringing faith, hope and love into the areas that we come into contact with. Lord, we pray. Amen.